dare you drink what's your own duty? Who is inside there? Sergeant Wilder! Sergeant Quiet! And you will behave like this and I'll have your stripes. Drop it. Duncan and both come correct. The, you need to get through this one to really get like, there's there's some Clouseau here, but there isn't nearly enough. And then after after this movie, it's just balls to the wall, Peter Sellers. Um, I'm I'm and, looking forward to that. Be we'll we'll get into it. Yeah. Um. But yeah, th- this definitely was a movie where, especially on the back end, I was like, this movie needs to hurry the fuck up. Um, yeah, yeah. That's what because he's not the main character. Yeah. And he's he wasn't supposed to be the main character, but. Um, I think uh, Blake Edwards, the director, and Peter Sellers, obviously, is Clouseau. And I think the audiences as well um, took a shine to that character, obviously. Um, And as a result, you're kind of off to the races. I think the second movie went into production, like, right after this. And it came out months after this. So, like, like, um, A Shot in the Dark came out super quick right in the heels of this one and it was a, a kind of smash it success so um but we'll get to it we'll get to all that we're gonna get to it. uh a smash in the uh wait no shot, a in, shot the... in the dark is the second one i don't uh, why did i want to call it a smash in the dark that's clearly not right <laughs> well there's a lot of smashing in it so and it's a smashing film though is is there smashing in it uh, yeah, he, he breaks a lot of things. <laughs> it's kind of amazing. Oh yeah, I can't, I can't, I can't even remember if that's the one where Herbert Long comes into it, and and might be the the one after that. And then, um, oh yeah, when he comes in, it's just oh man, we're gonna have so much fun. We're gonna have so much fun. Um, uh, Chief Inspector Dreyfus. Yeah. Uh, well, speaking of having fun, welcome everyone. Yes. <laughs> to uh a new season a new yeah. enterprise in the in the history of duncan and Bo come correct uh i of course am come correct with me as always is duncan yes <laughs> and uh i've look we were talking about this a little bit before the show i'm so excited to not be horizontal and yeah. sick i'm glad that we're recording again i know that we had to delay yet again but yeah, I, but was, you had Rona. Like, yeah. You had the Rona. So yeah. that's fine. It was it was like one of those things where like morning of I was like, I think I, I think we I can do this. And then uh like as I was getting up and moving around, I was like, Oh, I can't do this. Like I can't no. I can't be fun and silly and do dumb yeah. voices and yeah. act like I care <laughs> about the Pink Panther. Yeah. Um, <laughs> When when all I want to do is just like lay in bed and whimper softly, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, yeah, I like, but it's one of those things. All right, you know, we're going through one of those waves where like everyone I know has had like, coronavirus. Yeah, like I have still somehow, unless I like I said before, unless I've had it and the symptoms were mild on me, like really mild yeah. on me, which is a possibility. I know some mm-hmm. people that that have had that. I am one of the few people, I think, I think I'm one of the few people in my family, in my circle of friends, uh, in my circle of podcast friends, who hasn't had it. Yeah. And this particular wave running right now seems to be picking off everyone else. <laughs> right. Like, like, everyone it's that got hasn't the stragglers, had it. yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's starting to work its way through them. So um, it's either yeah. inevitable I will get it or... Uh, like I see, maybe I've maybe I've already, did. but then my wife's the same. Like she's not had it, and we're like, well, maybe both of us are just like super immune. I don't know. <laughs> right? Yeah. Like you're the ones that are going to end up in uh, in the farm with Mother Abigail. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, yeah. I well, I had had it either, and I was, you know, the work that I do takes me out in public to to some degree. And, um, and in addition to that, I am also now dating someone with, with kids who are of an age that are just, you know, they're Petri dishes themselves. Yeah. And so I was like, okay, well, if I'm going to get it, that, you know, this it's prepped, but I would have expected that I would have gotten it before, but I never did. And I, I have the same fantasy of like, maybe my constitution is just so good 
that well, coronavirus yeah. showed up and it was like fuck you and you know well I, I was on a i was on a stag weekend and i think everyone got it from that stag weekend except me yeah. i was at a gig um and i, I mean <laughs> I, it was a very very busy gig and i'm very surprised that everyone didn't have uh, covid at the end of that um i did something recently and people that were at that had covid so i like I, i'm at this point i I, I think I might be a god, Bo. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I, I thought that too. And uh, and still do to some degree, yeah. but just not about the coronavirus. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I got I got it waylaid by the COVID. And mm-hmm. uh, it, like it wasn't ever super severe. It was it was a thing like last as we're recording this like a week ago, Friday. Yeah. Um. That night in particular, or that day, I was like, I don't feel so good. And then by that night, I was like, I really don't feel good. And I think I'm running a fever because I'm starting to get chills. And yeah. I had to like Uber Eats or like get the delivery because I didn't have a thermometer. I don't get sick mm-hmm. enough that I didn't have a thermometer laying around. Mm-hmm. And my my girlfriend was like, well, you need to take your temperature because if you're, you know, if you're fever gets to a certain point you need to go to a hospital mm-hmm. uh and i was like yeah i don't i don't have one of those so i had to like uber uh somebody to bring me a ther- thermometer and uh and and sure enough i was running a fever it wasn't crazy i was you know 101 ish um uh, hot enough like i was running a hot enough fever that i, I did not feel good yeah and um but I, I had it through the weekend and you know we were talking about this before the show i still sound a little congested i guess i still am a little bit yeah. but i'm fine you know i feel good like uh that kangaroo i got out back i started boxing that again for my daily <laughs> workout <laughs> me and the roo <laughs> doing, doing a couple of rounds but uh, but the end result of it was like, oh, we had to delay recording yet again, which was a real bummer. Um, because in addition to that, Duncan, I don't know if you were aware of this, but I'm also going to school. I did know this. Yeah, yeah. And so um, let me tell you about this astronomy class. That is a real pain <laughs> in my ass. Um, but uh, yeah, so like in addition to being sick, like that weekend also was a weekend where it was like, okay, I'm actually going to spend a few hours working on astronomy because I need, I like, I am not what you would call science inclined, Duncan. Yeah. My, my gifts lie in the, in the larger realm of bullshit and essays. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an English major, you know? Uh so, so when people like want you to nail down an answer that's real and provable, that's where maybe my expertise uh, starts to wane. Um, but uh, anyway, so I didn't get an opportunity to do that. But that's what I was doing but before we recorded this morning. I was I was watching astronomy videos. So, um, but I'm almost done. The summer classes have been rugged. Yes, I'm, but I'm, there's an end in sight. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm I'm done in about two weeks with all of this, and then following that, um, my the next semester, my fall semester, when I actually graduate, um, it's it's two classes. They're both on Monday. It's a full semester. It's not like yeah. a compressed schedule. It's like, eh. and they're both English classes. So I'm back into the realm of like, yeah. just crazy <laughs> makeup ups. <laughs> yeah, back in the coast of it, bull. Love yeah. It. Right. Yeah, they're not even grammar classes. It's not even the it's not even the hard part of English, you know. Um, yeah, I I miss <laughs> I, I that's what I miss. Like as I'm I, like one of my classes though is a history class which has a fair amount of just like, oh, I can, you know, write some di- discussion posts and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And killing it, Duncan. Killing it. My guy. I got I, it's just I, I've got the gift of bullshit. And, <laughs> you know, I I wield it as much as I can. It's just again, astronomy is like my kryptonite. Where I like, you know, I can't... what are you going to actually use it for, Bo? Let's be honest. You know, it's super interesting. Like I find it fascinating. And that that's kind of the catch twenty two of it is that yeah. I really enjoy the material, but my professor is Russian, and I don't oh. trust her. 
Oh, she's Russian. Yeah. yeah. I never get that. Yeah. And, <laughs> and uh, so, but like the first couple of tests, the first test in particular, I was like, man, I didn't do well on this test at all. And, but then like the midterm grades come out and she's like, because of crazy Russian evaluation I use, you'll get A. And I'm like, great. That's fantastic. I don't know how you, all of a sudden I'm back on board with Russia. <laughs> right. Praise be putting. <laughs> right. Hail to glorious leader. <laughs> <laughs> that is right putin is son <laughs> but i was like this doesn't seem all right <laughs> <laughs> it's not big's been changed yeah um yeah <laughs> it's in the right textbook um <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's here's another thing that changed did i already complain to you about this about the te- school textbooks you did yes yes Fucking you did that was, a, that was a big bug bearer um yeah they have to like things move on Bo. i you know it does but uh, like kids don't buy music now or movies what so, like so what why would they buy books um, <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah you're right you're right um how you been doing though i, I know you were you're, you're working on lawn projects but yeah when it finishes my my back garden is going to be fucking incredible um yeah, but, yeah it um, is <laughs> Yeah, but I, once I can, like, once I get there though. So next Thursday it should be this Thursday coming. Sorry, it should be all finished. But I am manually building a large steel monolithic black pergola, um, and that's that um, in itself. It's not been fun, and I, that's what I was doing just just before. I was like building the pergola, praying for an astronomy class uh, to swap <laughs> for. Uh, but yeah, it was. Um, I, I'm almost I'm almost there with it, but it's it's gonna look it's gonna look very argento when it's finished. I've got all these um I've got all these hue lights. It's a, a brand of lights that are controlled from your phone mm-hmm. um, yeah, yeah, yeah. by an app, and they're all neon colors and all the rest. I've got them all set out the back, so it's it is gonna look something like right from a Bava movie um, when I finish. But I just have to get there first. So that's been I think that has been me, and obviously summer series is kicked off. For podcasts on this there so there's a lot of stuff happening with that which has been fun um, yeah i i meant to uh, i will do this off the air but remind me when whenever we get close to doing that second episode yes yes i will do i don't think you're in the back half so yeah. for for episode number two so we're, yeah, yeah. we're fine for time <laughs> we're, we're fine for time there but oh yeah i'll get that all uh Oh, sorry, but I think I've got five episodes recorded at the ten. Oh, wow, uh, that's great! So, like, I'm 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 at a good place, and it officially starts on Monday. Like, the first mm. group of episodes will go out then. So, um, and thus far, not that I want to brag, I think ninety percent of my picks have went through. So, I, I am scoring relatively high this year. Um, and the ones that I have went through that I was kind of against, couldn't give a fuck about it anyway. They're in years that I just don't care. Like my 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 movies that I want already went through. Uh, on the original run so when it comes to third pack i'm like yeah you know have whatever you want it ain't getting anywhere on the list i mean so yeah um, it's been if, good. if i can make one small confession oh prior to this conversation i would have told you that a pergola was a flightless bird <laughs> <laughs> what well, read that ac uh, yeah Oh, I can give it to you. Are you kidding me? I can give you a thousand words. Here's my three thousand words on Pergola, the flightless bird. Uh, yeah. That's a penguin. Bo. <laughs> it's a penguin. Let me. All right. So I don't. I don't know if I told you the, this. If I did, I apologize. Uh, like I got the COVID scrambled brain where I don't remember what happened before. Um, <laughs> I don't like. I don't understand any anything of history prior to that. Speaking <laughs> of history, though, so I'm taking a history class. That's just it's yeah. like a survey of American history through up through like civil war and reconstruction Mm -hmm. and uh for a while i was going to be a history minor so this is really my wheelhouse like i'm yeah yeah, yeah. familiar with this material to a large degree i i'm really interested in it i actually the textbook i think is actually well written and really fascinating i probably would have read it yeah yeah. without having to take a class and so forth so when we first start the class or when i first started the class the professor is uh, a little bit slow in doling out the grades. Right. Okay. So I was on a weekend trip with my girlfriend and I'm having to check in here and there, like do some discussion posts and stuff like that for, for the class. 
And the whole time, I'm like, why isn't she great at this? Like, she's commenting mm-hmm. on other people's discussion posts, and she's not commenting on my discussion post. And my discussion post kicks ass. And so <laughs> it was a real, like, Lisa Simpson, like, evaluate me kind of yeah. thing. And my, and it was really my, my girlfriend's first peek into the broken psychology that I have, where I'm just like, I need someone to tell me that I'm doing a good job. Yeah, validation. Right. That's why we podcast more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, totally. It's just, uh, yeah. I need, I need somebody to tell me. I mean, we crave attention. I, yeah. I think that's what it is. So, yeah. I right. Somebody needs to tell me that I'm pretty and funny, and yeah. and my professor was not doing that. Um, but like I said, you know, recently we had the midterms and stuff, and or the midterm evaluations, and uh, and my professor uh was actually saying like. I wish you had majored in history. You have a great uh, analysis or a gift for mm. analysis and stuff like that. And I was like, why couldn't you have done this when I was on vacation? Like, where was all this? <laughs> Hi, <now. clears throat> Pardon me. And my girlfriend rightfully was like, she didn't comment because yours is fine. And the other people, yeah. you know, she's trying to like direct. and, and Yes, yeah, so she, was, she was spending her attention helping those that needed it. For. Right. Instead of just like patting me on the head and telling me. <laughs> What a, a good pagala I've been. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh. Um, you want to talk about some movies? Yeah, yeah. There's, there's. Yeah, I mean, it's not as if we've we've had lots of free time uh, to do things. You know, it, things. that it, weirdly, that's the thing is, I really haven't watched a ton of movies recently. Yeah. Although I think I got the COVID from going to see that uh, Love and Thunder, the the Thor movie. Oh, um, right. I've still to see that. Uh, at this stage now, I probably won't even get to see it at the cinema. I will probably just wait off for uh, Disney+. Plus. It's fine. It's uh, If you enjoyed Ragnarok, you'll enjoy this. It, it's got some yep. funny shit in it, and that's all I wanted out of it. But that's not what I want to talk about. Um, yeah, go for it. Uh, okay, so uh, let me let me talk about my good question mark. I, it's a movie uh. that I just watched <laughs> that I, I'm just I'm, I'm fascinated by, and I just want to talk to you about it because I don't know if you've ever seen it. Oh, right, go for it. All right, have you ever seen The Birth of a Nation? The 1915, yes. like, three-hour-long yeah. detail? Uh, literally, thing. like, me and Baz are about to do it as uh, Baz's backdoor cinema. He picked it because he'd never seen it before, and he, he wants to discuss it because of its impact um, on the rebirth of the clan in America, i.e. this is his look into real-life horror. Uh, yeah, that he wants to cover. So yeah, like, I, 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 but weirdly, I had seen it before that. Okay, um, I saw it for the first time. Part of it, like, I had to do it for my history class. It's part of a project I'm working on. Yeah, but I'd never seen it. Oh right, right. And, like I knew of it, of course. Like I'd seen clips from it and that kind of thing, but I never sat down to watch it uh, until yesterday. Like yesterday was the first time I, I spent three hours plus yeah. watching D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation. Um, and it's such a weird movie to discuss mm. because there's, it's like, a, it's that tale of two cities thing of like, you know, the best of times it was the worst at times. Cause on, yeah. on one level, the birth of a nation is the Rosetta stone of cinematic vocabulary. Yeah. yeah. It, it's like the first movie that was like, Oh, here's this larger narrative and we're, doing like it's the tale of these two families across mm-hmm. the war and all that kind of stuff and there's battle sequences that are like this is really impressive for the time in which it was made oh yeah, yeah. you know impressive now actually <clears throat> pardon me and so there's that level where as i'm watching it i'm kind of like jaw dropped at how effective it is as just mm-hmm. a from a modern perspective, like this is a a silent film that is over a a century old, yeah, and it's like this totally works. Like this movie, as just as a movie, mm-hmm. this all works. Like here's where you're setting up the characters. Here's and even some of the performances, even though they're silent performances, I think Lillian Gish is actually surprisingly subdued in that movie mm-hmm. and, and that kind of thing. So there is that. <laughs> yes. Then there is the flip side of the birth of a nation, <laughs> where you're like, "What is this movie about?" Yeah. And on the one hand, again, this all seems like 
strangely contemporary because it is the story of two families who are sort of split by the civil war in America and Mm -hmm. what the aftermath of that looks like. The problem that you run into with the birth of a nation, Duncan, is that the supposition made by the film is that once civil war has ended, that black people just run amok in the South and terrorize all the good Christian white folks. Yeah. Largely helped by people from the North. One of whom actually says we will destroy the white empire and create a black empire (laughs) in its stead. And the hero of the movie is the guy who comes up with the Ku Klux Klan which is presented yeah. as n- nothing but a positive force oh, in the yeah. film as no- they go to rescue all the white, especially women, yes, from the clutches of blacks and mulattoes. Particularly the villainous mulatto lieutenant governor who does everything short but of, you know, twirling his mustache. Oh, yeah. If, if he had a mustache. Um, and that is also, that is equally jaw dropping as the technical achievement of the film, because Mm -hmm. you're like, I I understand times were different in 1915, but were they that different? Maybe that's like, I think if you chart it back though, I think in terms of like segregation to like a point between, between, you know, uh, those of an African American persuasion and those of a like a kind of white freaking puritanical nonsense persuasion. Mm. Um, things weren't actually all that bad, you know. They were pretty, you know. There was still there was still t- to a degree in certain certain places in America like deep divisions, but you know things were actually starting to go on the upswing. And then that movie came out, and then guess what? Like. Everything regressed real fucking fast. Yeah. And it's just so is that you are right. I think it's as weirdly as a it's an incredibly poignant movie, mostly because of the last what 15 years mm-hmm. in America where things have so maybe even slightly longer than that, since maybe about 99, um, where things have started to slide back down uh a you know a very visible divide along party lines. Um and even beyond those party lines, where you just see like this kind of a very kind of fundamental Christian, which it's like at this stage, 2022, you would have thought a lot of that nonsense would just be fucking gone. Um, or that a very kind of evangelical swing towards absolute fucking nonsense. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and very, very ethnocentric. Very, oh, yeah. very wide. It, it, like the whole replacement theory stuff and all that stuff is kind of baked into this sense of, you know, it's the story that white people of a certain political stripe, especially, have been yeah. told of like, hey, by the way, the America that you knew and loved is disappearing and, you know. And yeah. and the black people in the north are gonna make your but it's like yeah, yeah. I, I think it's, it's it's so it's so bizarre that like the Amer- the America that you know and love is is disappearing is such a I I don't know I think like I've, I've always said to, to me the uh, country should march forward and always march forward and never stay complacent or like frozen and what like because that's when. That's how you get a North Korea right mm-hmm. like when things all freeze in place. You know, one leader, one ruler. You know, that's when that's when shit gets scary. You've always got to like, you've got to keep moving forward. People that ping for yesteryear are people that like genuinely only remember the good things that happen mm-hmm. at that time and never remember the bad things. Like, and there's plenty. Like I, I've, I've said, like I think as well when well, you know, we never used to have we never used to have this level of of unrest. Yes, you did. Yeah, yeah. Like, see if you open a textbook, go back. Like, the word there will obviously fuel prices and the crisis and all the rest that's happening just now is uh, is kind of swaying things up. And like, as a result of that, you see certain news publications like linking back to like the UK riots in the eighties and the seventies, and like all these things. And you see on such a mass mass scale. And I look at that, and I look at now, and I'm like, 
things are fine just now. Yeah. Like, 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 there are tens of thousands of people on the street, you know, like, 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 industry, everything's striking, everything's like the country is ground to halt. And I look around them like, ah, like people are still working. Like, like so as like, regardless, is every every I think every generation wants to make everything happen feel like the most important or the best or the worst or whatever to define that era that we that you live in. Um and interestingly linking back to the history thing is that's what makes history so fascinating mm-hmm. it's also the reason you can't just whitewash history out uh, that's the importance of it because when you go back it really does give you context to value where you are um and it's not just repeating the same mistakes but it's to it's to sum up exactly i think sometimes people look at like the worst aspects of history as well which is like a noble in itself but you can only chart how far a society you have moved on progressed and bettered yourself by being able to compare where you came from. Um, And in a lot of respects, that movie, um, it it does show you where you have traveled from, but the scary thing is it also shows that there there appears to be a swing back on that pendulum happening at the moment, which isn't, isn't helping anyone, nor will it help anyone. Yeah. Um, Well, in, in the thing that's interesting about even the time that birth of a nation was made was there mm -hmm. was, there was an attempt at the time that Griffith was influenced by to yeah. sort of recontextualize reconstruction after the civil war and say, Oh, it was like the South really was the victim of Northern opportunism and that kind of thing. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know that that's totally with, without merit, but it's certainly not the rule, <laughs> you know, yeah. like that, that, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure that happened, but also, it was the South kind of coming to terms with its legacy and blah, blah, blah. And um, so there were like Griffith wasn't alone in what, in, in the kinds of things that birth of a nation espoused and presented. Mm -hmm. It's just that when you put it all together like that and it's, you can't deny that like, Oh, this was made by someone who has very racist ideology. Yeah. And like the, the, and you know, but, and also to your point of, you know, the, like, well, we need to go back to the old days when it was better. And the yeah. question that they don't ask themselves is for who? Yeah. It was well, this better is, for you, but not women, not, not black people. This is, this is where, this is, not, like, this is where we're stuck in the UK in the moment. Like we're obviously in the throes of Brexit um, because and I, I, I don't want to generalize, but like on paper statistically speaking england wanted to leave the european union um the majority of scots didn't Mm -hmm. the majority of uh people in northern ireland didn't um and like where we are and it's mostly because of the narrative of you know like back to the old days where we controlled our borders and you know all the rest the result of this the result of this is that there is now a massive, massive, massive shortfall on skilled labour in the UK, and we're we're talking what we're like what two years into Brexit, yeah. massive shortfall, huge shortfall, and oh, well, I, 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 all these waiting times at the at the hospital, you know, like like can't get a tradesperson to do a certain thing and all the rest. Like, oh, I wonder why that is. The reason it is, is the freedom of movement that you had in the European Union, which allowed skilled workers from other countries to come to this country to work. They're all gone. Yeah. And guess what? People in England, once again, without generalizing, a lot of them, pretty fucking lazy. So, you know what I mean? Maybe we'll take you, a job. What you would yeah. call unskilled. Yeah, well, it's not even that unskilled, like just they, they receive a degree of benefits for not working. And as a result don't see the need to work or you know that's not the job for me yeah, yeah. um and it's that sort of level where all those jobs would be picked up by someone else who was eager to live in this country work and pay taxes um and that's where we are now and it just it's 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 absolutely fucking laughable um that that's the the position is in and well there's genuine surprise Ge- like ge- like honestly genuine surprise and all that was all that information was made available at the time. It's just, wouldn't you like to be, wouldn't you like it to be the way it used to be? Right. That wasn't the yep. stuff that was on the sides of buses. 
no, 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 wasn't, wasn't. But he's gone now, so man, um, I, you know, we'll we'll jump to the next movie here in a second. But boy, Boris Johnson piecing out of his job was one of the most like graceless exits I've ever seen of a political figure. Did you? His, his last prime minister's questions. His sign off was "Hasta la vista, baby." Yeah. I shit you not, yeah. that's what he said. Um, is it easily, easily, in recent memory, e- but, uh, recent memory, and I'm going back like 50 years, easily the worst prime minister that there's ever been in the UK. Uh, and the reason he got removed wasn't for the lion, wasn't for like the misinformation, wasn't for all the fucking corruption. And there's loads of that that will still come out. Wasn't for breaking COVID rules several times and being fined for it. Uh, the only sitting prime minister to be officially fined by the police mm-hmm. um, for breaking the law. Only one, only one. It wasn't all that. It was because he promoted willingly someone into his cabinet who was known as a, a like a sex offender is yeah. the easiest way to do it, like sexually assaulted uh, other men. And uh, he knew about it beforehand and did it and... When it got leaked at first that he knew about it, he denied about it, lied, and then all this information came out said he he wasn't lying. Uh, and then tons of information came out saying he was fucking lying. It turns out that was more credible. And that's why he left. Not all the other stuff he's done. And I, I like his response when they were like, uh, we have a, you know all this proof that you knew about this ahead of time. Oh, I yeah. forgot that I knew. I mean, he seems to forget a lot of yeah. things, which is what you want in a prime minister. <laughs> Just like someone that's really forgetful about really important things. Um, I, you know, but just a fucking dickhead, man. I hate him. <laughs> I absolutely fucking hate him. There, there's a little bit of hopefulness, though, because in addition to, like, at the same time that Boris Johnson is is exiting stage right, yeah. Um, there's also, you know, like, we've had all these hearings here in the States about what happened on January 6th, and it's pretty... Unless you're just close to the idea that, you know, Donald J. Trump could do any wrong. Yeah. Unless you are just living in that world where you're just not going to believe the testimony of people who were there at the time. Yeah. um, Then there's just no question like, oh, he was, you know if not legally at fault, at least morally at fault for what happened. Yeah. And, and it looks like it's probably gonna do him in, you know, like at least hopefully and like the thing is these, these guys seem to skirt by, uh, because people, people just don't, just don't put their faith in facts anymore. They, yeah. they think that everything comes with an agenda and that's sad. Uh, that is sad. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. We're, so we'll go through, this is, try to think now, uh, it was David Cameron mm-hmm. and then Theresa May mm-hmm. and then Boris Johnson and now either Liz Truss, who is a fucking moron. Mm-hmm. Um, can't stress that enough. If you ever get a chance, listeners out there, um, Google Liz Truss Sausages um, <laughs> where she's at a conference and she's very excited to be talking about British sausages. And I'm like, yeah, she could be leading the country and you know, formulating war policy. Uh, her or a Rich, Richie Sunak, who was Boris Johnson's chancellor, who um, is, I think he is in the top 10 richest people in the UK. Uh, um, that's, that's always who you want, is somebody who's really got their finger on the pulse. Yeah, who at the moment thinks that we haven't went far enough on taxing poor people so that's either neither one of them chosen by the british public to to, but that's what we do here and everything's blamed on the previous government because people have forgotten that the last 12 years have been tories in government like it's it's just it's mind-boggling as like i I, if i could and i know it upsets certain friends of mine but if i could i would take a jackhammer out and saw my country right off the end of england um and it's getting worse like that's why i can't look at news like stories or anything anymore like i i genuinely have a a, you know a a liking for english people and then i see the worst of it on tv and then i just want away from it um uh yeah so (sighs) Uh, all right well uh, that was my (laughs) that was your good question yeah i mean 
I just a movie that I, I felt like was worth having a conversation about because it's 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 fascinating. And I encourage people like, yes, it is dreadfully racist. Like, yeah, it is. It is truly a historical artifact of, of racist ideology of the time. Mm-hmm. But it's also if you're a movie fan, it's kind of required viewing just because it is so significant in the history of filmmaking. Um, but anyway, so that's my good slash terrible movie. <laughs> uh, but what what about you? Where where do you want to start? Uh, yeah, so I've been doing a lot of documentary watching because I'm doing a lot of movie watching for summer series, which I've been my palate cleansers documentaries. There's a great one. Um, I use the word great and I like it's absolutely repugnant. Um, but there's a great one on the FLDS up on Netflix at the moment, a three part um, on what was his name? Uh, Jeff, 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 Jeff Johns. No, Jeff. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the Mormons folk, Jeff, the, the Fuck. It was so great I've forgotten his name. Yeah. Um, um Wayne Wayne. Can't remember. Anyway, you'll find it while we're doing while yes, we're doing this. I, I'm uh, fact directing a... checking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um it's a it, it essentially charts the the what they would class as the last prophet and the, the fundamental Jeff Warren. Warren Jeff Warren, Warren, Jeff, Warren, Warren Jeffs. Warren Jeffs, right? All right, sorry. I had I had the two things there. I just couldn't put them together. Um, also, strange name. Uh, but yeah, like so. Basically, his um, rise to power from his father, essentially dying, and he was part of the fundamental Mormon movement, which was all about like as many waves as possible, like all the waves. Um, but it, it charts his, and I I knew the name, and I knew there had been. I knew he was in prison. I didn't know why he was in prison. And this documentary opens your eyes in a way which is absolutely fucking terrifying, which is all about pedophilia and uh, child abduction and grooming. And yeah, just like absolutely horrendous shit. Like absolutely horrendous shit. But it's a really, really, really well-made documentary. So it charts over three three episodes, essentially his rise to power from his father dying um, and then his kind of consolidation of power before his essential kind of last movement, which is the creation of a a, a compound in Texas, because that's where you go to build a compound, Mm -hmm. uh, which was called Zion. Um, and he would start moving people out there, but he slowly started removing the parents. So it was just kids that were there. Um, and yeah, um, it's absolutely horrific. I, but you get you get like lots of people who essentially left the the, the church um, coming through interviews and talking through different points, and you chart their experiences as well as subsequently their kind of fractured relationships with their families who some of them are still in the church and you know are forbidden to talk to those that have left the church and just a very 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 bizarre um situation that once again this is recent times he yeah. he was a, a, he was um he went down like a couple of years ago as <laughs> where he finally when he finally got arrested because there was recorded evidence of him having sex with a 12 year old and telling her it was holy. What, what was the Netflix also was, it, I think it was Netflix that did that doc. Um, Jimmy, the, the, uh, British TV personality. Oh, Jimmy Savile. Jimmy Ooh. Savile. Yeah. I watched that. Not, not too terribly long ago. And it's, it was, it's hard one. Yeah. It's hard one. The same kind of thing of just like, what, you know, like I worse with worse with Savile, worse with Savile because people knew. Yeah, yeah. Or people people yes. were new and people were enabling not those that were part of a religious group. Yeah. Who thought this guy was the prophet, i.e., was the word of God. And that's why they're, you know, they go along with that sort of thing. These were people in the industry who knew about it. Um, and I, I remember I grew up watching. Jim will fix it on the TV and Jimmy Fa- Jimmy Savile doing his various bits and bobs on there. And he'd already been, he was already like hugely established as a TV personality at that point. 
and he'd been doing it forever. His contact with the Royal Fat, like absolutely horrendous shit, yeah. like horrendous shit, and none of it came out until he died, which to me is the the fucking the coward's way out. Um, it's all oh, right a story now he's dead. No, get him now and you can do time. Mm-hmm. Ah, yeah, fuck. yeah, right. It, 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 yeah. You know, let's and- destroy his legacy now that he's dead. No, 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 no. That does nothing to the victims. Yeah, yeah. So and, yeah, that's uh, I, I. That's a documentary I will probably end up watching anyway because there is something about uh the rise. It's excellent. Of a it's an, yeah, it's an excellent documentary. Um, and very much worth your time. And they don't leer over the the pedophilic stuff, but what they do go into detail is just how warped the sense of religion was at the time that the, it was just seen okay to marry fourteen year olds to sixty year old men. Yeah, that to me is like just like right. Can't can't quite wrap my head around that at all. Um, and we'll have twenty waves. And um, like just that stuff. I, I mean, yeah. And the fact that it's illegal in America to be a polygamist, mm-hmm. but no one gets arrested for it. And I'm like, surely right. that's like, to me, that feels like an easy crime to prove. <laughs> right. Are you married to him? Yes. Are you yeah. also married to him? Yes. <laughs> well, I think we got you dead to rights. Book him, Dano. You right. know what I mean? It's like, like, this literally feels like it'd be very, very easy to prove. And you want to know how you, you want to know how you kind of, I'm not saying like remove completely, but really stamp down on ideas that you can get away with things by making arrests, Bo. Yeah. See if you have a law that you don't prosecute on, what's the point? Like, like there's no deterrent there at all for anyone not to do something. Um, And it turned out, I think uh, one one of the things that come away was one of the, it was in Salt Lake City or something um, on the original run, one of the police officers who ultimately had been questioned a few times by the media um, like it turned out that he had like a child bride or something. And that's why he wasn't pursuing things. And I'm like, for fuck's sake, Jesus Christ! So yeah, uh, it was good though. It was really, really, really good. But so, I like I sometimes like to revel in watching things about the worst of humanity. Yeah. So it was really good. And so was that John John Wayne Gacy documentary? People haven't seen that. On oh Netflix. yeah, I did watch that. That is that's really yeah. creepy. Yeah, really cool. The end, the last five minutes where they're talking to like surviving family members and flashing up the photos of the you forget how many people mm-hmm. he actually murdered. Like, and the fact that they're still, even up until last year, they managed to identify one of the six remaining unidentified bodies in there. It just like whoa. I'm glad we're getting all this like harrowing stuff out before we talk about uh Nice old romantic romp. Yeah. Pink Panther uh, uh, of farce. Uh, all Butterfuck. right. All right. So here's my bad slash good. <laughs> oh, for... you just like, you're like blurring the lines here. I, I, you know, that's what I do. Duncan is, uh, <laughs> Love those lines. Yeah. Non-binary movie watching. That is, <laughs> that's my thing. No, I, I finally caught up to a movie called broadcast signal intrusion. Oh, I love this. All right. So I mostly did. Oh, okay, right. but I'll I'll tell you the problems I had with with it, which are kind of minor in the grand scheme of things, but it would yeah. have made the movie like one of my favorite movies. But uh, so, broadcast signal intrusion uh, for listeners who don't know, it's about a guy whose wife has uh, uh, disappeared, yep. presumed dead, mm-hmm. um, is not handling it real well. Um, and he works as, uh, basically the, uh, an archivist where it's transferring like old tape yeah. to, you know, DVDs essentially, um, for like uh, on television station, like news reports and television shows and anything that was broadcast. And as he's doing this, he runs across what's called a broadcast signal intrusion, which is where a pirate of some kind, um, you know, basically uh, pirates the signal and yeah. puts up a video. And a lot of times it's real juvenile stuff of like, you know, we control the vertical and, you know, yeah. down with capitalism or whatever. <laughs> and in this case, though, it's this like hella creepy image of uh, somebody in kind of a doll mask yeah, with this crazy audio laid over it. And it's just like 
disturbing and vague and yeah. there's no, very Poughkeepsie tapes. Very Poughkeepsie tapes. Yeah. And um so naturally you know, he starts to dig into it a little bit and this leads to this kind of obsess- uh, obsessive hunt for who did this. There were other of mm-hmm. these intrusions, but uh, only two that were kind of proven, but there was a rumor third and, you know, and it's basically about this guy who just has lost his bearing yeah. in terms of, you know, the life that he thought he was going to lead. And now he finds himself in a position where he's kind of hunting for meaning. Like it, it like ultimately it's, it's sort of a story about somebody who thought he, he had life figured out and then realized mm-hmm. Oh, like chaos and randomness can happen to you. And then what do you do in the wake of that? Yeah. And, um, and rather than like look to human beings and, and, and support, uh, to help him, like he goes to a support group, but he never says anything. And the one person Mm -hmm. in that support group that is like, Hey, how about, you know, we go for a drink sometime and, you know, we'll watch a movie. And he's just like, Oh, I can't do that. That sounds like human contact. And that's not my jam. (laughs) um uh so but this has a a lot of things that i like in a movie one is like a mysterious videotape or in this case uh like this signal intrusion and the hunt to find that there there's a lot of zodiac in this movie yeah yeah. um and i like all of that and this kind of hunt for a, a potential killer and um the thing that i don't like about the movie is I think it's a little long and I think it, it, I think there's just one too many instances of we found this thing that leads us to the next thing that leads us to the next thing. And I know that's kind of the point, but also after you go, you know, uh, slight spoilers, but this will be vague enough that I'm not giving anything away. (laughs) But once you go from, Oh, uh, here's this, random telephone number to here's this storage facility to Mm. here's this other thing to here's this other thing that by the time you kind of get to the end and, and start to get, you know, some answers essentially. Um, I was like, I would, I wish we had gotten here 15 minutes sooner. Yeah. Uh, I can see that. I can see that. And I also think that the very end of the movie, like the, the last shots of the movie, um, (laughs) I, I was like, I, again, I get it, but also, eh, I, you know, I, I wish that you could, you could have left this in a different place. Yeah. And I think it would have been as effective, if not more so to kind of hammer home the idea that this is a dude who, who has gone too far that like he's, he, even, even if he's gotten some kind of answer and, and potentially done some heinous shit of his own um that there's no like th- there's no life beyond this for him that this is yeah. you know like and we kind of got that with the the dude who who um uh, he runs into who's been on the hunt for this for a long time and mm-hmm. um i i wish i almost wish you had just paralleled that of yeah. like shown him in that place later yeah, yeah, you know where you're like, oh yeah, of course, you know this led him down this deep dark hole. That all said, I was still really engaged by the movie, and I really had a good time with it. I just like I would make certain tweaks to it yeah, just yeah. to make it a better movie. But I was mm-hmm. still like, there's a scene where they talk to this guy who you know is paying the bill on uh, this storage facility that kind of is part of their link of clues. And I was like, I, I more of all of this. This yeah. is that, <laughs> this is that Zodiac thing. I love so much of like, here's a guy that may be more of a threat and you don't really know. Yeah, you, do, you don't like you, you've like that, that moment where you that kind of cold clarity washes over you. Like, does anyone actually know I'm here? And why am I here? And I don't actually really know this guy all that well. Yeah. And also, yeah. what is that sound that we're hearing? Like, is somebody else yeah. here? You know, that yeah, was yeah. the point where I was like, oh, this is good. Where, where yeah, yeah. Like, is somebody else here with us right now? And yeah, like that stuff is really good. But it's, 
it's totally worth it. If you haven't seen Broadcast Central uh, Signal Intrusion, totally worth your time. Mm. Um, I, I wish it had been this much better uh, just so that I would love it instead of really like it. And that's yeah. kind of where I walked away from it. I was like, I really like that. I wish, I w- you know, um, it kind of falls into that like cigarette burns territory for me as well of, yeah, you know, we're on the hunt for, or even in the mouth of madness to some degree, even though it doesn't go quite. Yeah, it's a, there's, a, there's a bit of, there's a bit of that. There's a bit of eight millimeter in there. Yeah. Uh, Nick Cage movie. There's a bit of, even a, the one that I mentioned, I keep mentioning um, Murder, Death, Korea, Tim about that idea of just someone who like finds that he has just like lots of that and starts hunting something which he starts to think is a lot grander than it necessarily might be. Mm-hmm. Um, and where that actually leads them. And the story itself is more about the, yeah, there is a mystery there, but it's equally about what the characters actually try to find within themselves, if you know what I mean, or what he's missing which is driving this forward. So yeah, I thought, I thought it was really good. Um, it did make me, it, cause it came out the same year as a uh, sensor as well. Yeah. And sensors um, a superior much. Film. Yeah. Like yeah. that's, that's the thing. Like in a year where sensor hadn't come out and just like absolutely fucking hit a home run with it. I think like I would probably be a bit higher on broadcast signal intrusion, but very much like yourself, I found the end in, like I've seen that end and done in several yeah, movies yeah. before. I think that's where I was kind of hoping because I'd seen I'm mean, at least try different things throughout the movie, or at least his own spin on it. That I thought by the time we got to the end, I would get something that was a bit more unexpected than it was. Um, which brings me to my my yes. bad. Um, this doesn't do me any joy saying this, uh, but I checked off season. Um, I have seen this as well, so yeah, yes. Yeah, the Mickey Keaton, who I I like as a director, I really like him as a director. Um, he did that movie, it was Darling, mm-hmm. I think it was, uh, which was kind of his take on Repulsion by a uh, Polanski. Yeah, um, and it was really, really, really good. I really liked that. He did a movie called Psychopaths a couple of years ago as well, which was really good. Uh, but he's done a couple of movies that I don't like. He did that Pod movie, which I didn't like, and um, he did uh, was it Carnage Park or something? Yeah, yeah, which, which was okay. Um, but this has and, Jocelyn Donahue, yes, from House of the I, Devil. Yes, it has her. It has Jeremy Gardner. Richard, it has Jeremy Gardner in a camera. It has Richard Brake, who mm-hmm. is playing Richard Brake. Um, <laughs> it has Larry Fesden, who no doubt dies, although he must die off screen because uh, I can't remember seeing him die. But you know, it has it has a really it has a relatively good cast. Um, it has a bit more money than what he's played with before, and the first half of the movie notwithstanding a silly reason to get someone back on an island. Um, the first half of the movie, I was really into it. I had a kind of almost a Silent Hill mm-hmm. sort of vibe with it. This mystery of everyone's acting weird on the island. I wonder why that is. And I was, I was totally into that. And then the back half became the most predictable, ponderous, and I described it as lazy Lovecraft mm-hmm. um, because the ending in particular just felt just a little bit too much like, oh, of course, the ancient ones. Oh, all hail Cthulhu. Um, it just became a little bit oh, kind of... Mm. And then the the very, very end of the movie was what I kind of thought was going to happen five minutes into the movie, which like irritates me when I, when I can be with a movie like right at the start and be like, oh, well, this is the final shot. Um and yeah, so I came, I came away with it uh, like w- heavily underwhelmed by the whole thing overall. Thought the performances were good, thought the script was okay, thought the first half of the movie really, really well put together. The last half of the movie was a paint by numbers horror movie that I've seen done so many times before. And I'm kind of over the, you know, you were always the caretaker sort of moment in a yeah. movie. Like I'm over that now. I'm like, just do something else, um, please. Anything else? Like even make it a dream. I can live with it being a dream. Please don't like you know like I, I, that. So that did not work for me at all, which was a shame because there was a lot of elements I thought were were put together really well. But I'll probably never watch it again. So. Oh no 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 no! It th- that was a movie that I think like as soon as it was finished, I felt like I had seen that movie. Not just once, but a hundred times. And... Which is weird because I, in the past, he's done things that feel familiar, 
to other works, but he's done a really interesting element or really went in hard on the character study, mm-hmm. which I think is the, the kind of fascinating bit. And we didn't get that at all in this movie, yeah. um, which made me wonder why made me wonder why because he wrote and directed it so he can't hide behind the well it was someone else's script or someone else's story this was his vision and it just was a bit meh yeah i and i think maybe because not so long ago i watched dagon again and it's there like, was huge elements of that in there yeah. right except it doesn't have nearly the sloppy fun of dagon yeah. yes and it, it's like this is a very somber very self-serious movie that doesn't have any surprises like you said yeah and all the cameos are of like all mm-hmm. the kind of smaller roles like joe swanberg's in it joe swanberg from your next plays are, are who is a great actor who fucks off 10 minutes into the movie and doesn't come back yeah melora walters plays the mother yes. from you yeah. know magnolia and a million other things and yeah. um yeah, it, it it it's really frustrating because there are lots of ingredients there for a really good creepy horror movie yeah. and it becomes a completely predictable ultimately kind of dull horror movie which is it, like that last half is just where all the action's kicking yeah. off and I could not care. Mm-hmm. Could not care at all. Um so yeah. yeah. And I also you know what I hate? What do you I what hate, else do you hate? like I absolutely hate movies that knowingly have a character break the the wall between the movie and the audience by kind of looking at the camera and smiling. Oh, right. Which she does right at the end of the movie, and there's no other precedent in the entire movie for that. Um, so fuck that. I hate that. I absolutely hate that. Like, like have something somewhere else in the movie where it's been done before, but that knowing wink at the audience is what? What's that supposed to indicate? That she's happy where she is? Or... Or like, because I got that from the scene before, or you know, like she's there because she was always supposed to be there, and like it's like I don't, I don't, I don't get what that's supposed to be, other than a massive middle finger to me, <laughs> like personally. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. That's a bummer. Um, yeah. Well, shall we turn our attention, Duncan, to uh, the the project at hand? Yes. Which is, uh, of course are the beginning of our journey into the world of the pink panther yeah yeah this is like i picked this i Mm -hmm. picked this i can't remember exactly how it came up in conversation but i like through conversation with you we realized really quickly that you've not seen any of these all the way through Uh, and you may have seen clips and clips just won't do boy i I feel like i had seen mostly this Oh, right. Well, yeah, that's probably why you didn't go much further yeah. than this. This is not like the, like, we're going to, we're going to be specifically following the Pink Panther um, through all its iterations, uh, its many different versions of Inspector Clouseau. But to do that, you have to start back in 1963 with the Pink Panther, mm-hmm. um, which brings us the glorious combination of Blake Edwards as the director. Blake Edwards, who was famously married to Julie Andrews. Uh, from the Cinder Music for many, many, many years. Um, but yeah, so you've got Blake Edwards directing. Uh, he brings in one Peter Sellers uh, as a small bit part character as his bumbling French detective called Inspector Clouseau. That turns out to be the big success of this movie. And then it spawns, like, see where you see how where we end up with this character from where we start. It is like, it's like, how the fuck did we get here and why were we not here to begin with so we have to get through this one to start really getting to the stuff that i want to talk about yeah Um, and it is a big old 1960s farce yes and so yeah 63 is when this premiered blake edwards originally had peter ustinoff in the peter sellers role yeah so peter ustinoff for those that might not know out there peter ustinoff about this era was known for playing Hercule Poirot, mm-hmm. which makes a ton of sense as to why you would have him as Inspector Clouseau. <laughs> so he's like, it would be inverting the, the the performance that he would ultimately become very, very, very famous for. As um, because we're we're on our what we're on our tenth Poirot now. Mm-hmm. It's Kenneth Branagh currently playing him, but Peter Ustinov, very large, rotund fellow. 
Um, I actually think his wife might be in this movie. Yeah, I think that was the thing, was that he was going to be in the movie because his wife was in it, and then yeah. he ended up getting bounced out. Uh, I eh, I might be impugning him, but I think it was because he was drinking. I, um, uh, yeah, yeah, Peter used to be awful like to drink. Uh, <laughs> A lot of actors at this time period like to drink. <laughs> so uh, Ava Gardner was yeah. going to be in it she got bounced because of a little drinky boo um yep. and then <laughs> and then uh capuchin <laughs> was hired uh and then peter ustinov's wife was like no 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 th- this is gonna suck if ava gardner's not in it so you need to yep. get out and so peter ustinov withdrew and that's the point where peter sellers stepped into the the role of uh Clouseau. Yeah. and <laughs> and so all right um it's got an amazing cast the cast is ridiculous yeah right like across the board this is just all like this is like a like a a, a kind of crossover point of kind of like elite level Brit- british acting and up-and-coming american and foreign actors all meeting together here you have like I, I, it's very difficult even though uh, David Niven is like, he's getting on by this movie. It's very difficult not to look at this guy and feel like, you know, I would shag him. You know what I mean? He's, he's that fucking charming. He, he's getting a little up there by the time yeah. this movie rolls around. Remember, he's still uh, got, a t- there's a twinkle in his eye, but like yeah. when you see like Robert Wagner is so fucking young in this movie. That's the thing. Robert Wagner steps in and is just like, you are the handsome son of a bitch that ever was yeah um, it's it's so bizarre to see it's like that way when you watch um like if you've ever seen the it's the raven uh the uh corman mm-hmm. poe movie and you're like that that looks like a really 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 young jack nicholson wait one second that's a really 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 fucking young jack nicholson and the guy is like like rid- like not only is it like there's faultless face yeah, like yeah. not a mark not a blemish just a really 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 attractive looking guy <laughs> like just like um and kind of robert wagner's the same like you forget because you, you everyone kind of came to him maybe a little bit later on you forget that he'd been around for as long as he had and there was a time period where it was like oh yeah he's the eye candy of the movie he's the young uh david niven mm-hmm. in this movie he's like the, he's the next generation coming up um so he's great he's perfectly cast in this one peter sellers who uh, if you believe the, the 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 rumor and innuendo on this one peter sellers was very body conscious mm-hmm. in real life he'd always had a bit of weight about him um and went into a strict regime of basically trying to get himself in shape for the role as Clouseau, because he wanted to be very slight, kind of leading man mm-hmm. um, esque, but was still ultimately bummed out that he was cast amongst, you know, someone like a Robert Wagner, who like you can work out all you want, but you don't have cheekbones like that. So, like, yeah. the and genetics it, just ain't there. So. And, and also probably led to his heart attack. Well, yes. Uh, <laughs> Sellers had a heart attack right before this movie. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. But. Anyway, all right. So, the scale that I propose for this, this is a, you've already you've already put this on Facebook, and I think I think this is kind of think it's kind of great. I don't I think unfortunately it's going to stifle this movie, but it's going to benefit like subsequent yeah. ones, like the one after this, a shot in the dark. If it does not score high on the bow scale, then I say the bow scale is warped and wrong. So I, I proposed laughs per hour. How many yes. times in in an hour of film am I laughing? Uh, and we'll 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 reach that at the end and discuss it. <laughs> um, but uh, that is the scale because again, yeah. these are supposed to be lighthearted romp comedies, and this yes. is you know as you say, I haven't seen the other ones, but this is unique in that this is like an ensemble cast movie, and it's not just focused on Clouseau. The one cut, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Clouseau is, but like for all intents and purposes, when this movie was envisioned and made, Clouseau is a backseat character, not the main character. The main character of this movie is David Niven. He's the guy you're supposed to be following. 
uh, in this one as the Pink Panther, well, as in the, you know, the thief, the jewel thief, um, who's going to steal the Pink Panther. And so, all right, so this thing kicks off with a scene that it takes place years before the later events of the movie yeah. where there is a young princess Dala is her name mm-hmm. who is being given a, a diamond, a jewel uh, called the pink Panther, which, mm-hmm. you know, before I ever saw this movie, which happened later any, anyway, um, I was like, Oh yeah, the pink Panther is that cartoon. It's like, Oh no, no, no. The pink Panther is just the name of this diamond. Yeah. And the cartoons spun off this, so yeah. they had animated credits for this movie because that's what they wanted. Um, yeah. They wanted that, like, an, and that became so popular that the Pink Panther that you know with the theme song and all the rest comes from this. A lot of people think it went the other way around, and the cartoon was first. No, 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 no. Uh, it comes from this. So yeah, and and so the the titular Pink Panther is just a flaw in the diamond itself that kind that's of right. resembles a panther. And so the, but it's this Maharaja uh, <laughs> giving his daughter this, this gift and explaining, here's what the Pink Panther is. Yeah. And then we go to credits, which is the cartoon Panther. Yeah. And also the real star of this movie, as far as I'm concerned, short of, <laughs> of Peter Sellers, which is the amazing music. Yeah. Um, ba-dum, ba-dum, it, yeah. Ba-dum, it is so groovy that, ba-dum, that bass of just ba-dum, boom, ba-dum, boom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's so good. Uh, and and even when it's used in that movie, as soon as you get the that, you know, bum 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 bum, yeah. bum, bum it, you're like, oh well, this is now. I feel like I'm watching a movie. Yeah, um, yeah. It's, it's it's a it's a great theme. It's a great theme. Yeah, and it like the the opening cartoon bit and that music was maybe my greatest memory of this film. And so, like, later on, when it, it gets into all the snow bunny shit, I was like, people are skiing in this movie? <laughs> but, but, all right, so let me start off with, with a question yeah. in the opening scene. Because there it starts off, like, David Niven uh, is, is the you know, would be star of this movie if Peter Sellers had not been in it. Yeah, he, play, he plays a character called Sir Charles and yeah. Sir Charles is the the famous phantom thief. Yeah. And uh, what he is, he's a cat burglar who is renowned on the world who leaves a calling card of his glove with his initials and <laughs> in um, wherever he goes. And um, so that's, that's he's he's a guy you're, I, I believe he's a guy you're supposed to be following. And I think the intention maybe on some level was a handing of the torch if they were going to continue this over to a kind of Robert Wagner right? sort of the younger phantom uh, moving forward. But like I say, the, the, like you can see there's, there's, I, I adore Peter Sellers. Absolutely. And, and there's just that you can just see just little things early in here where you're like that. Oh, this is, there's something here. Like I can just imagine being very excited about that. But yeah, that's the so all right. That's the, the kind of idea. Yeah, and, and and it opens on him swiping something and kind of coming out the window of this place and going down a yeah. rope. My question is when his buddy lights the rope yeah. to force him to go back inside, was his buddy just screwing with him? I have no idea. I don't like, I didn't understand. I was like, what is happening here? Where David Niven is just like, well, I've done it. I've, I've stolen yet another jewel. Oh, yeah. damn it, Frank. You've, yeah. you've lit the rope on fire. Frank has ghosted me. Um, Frank. I, 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 don't, I don't know. This is because I, I, I slept with your wife, isn't it, Frank? <laughs> I get it. I get it. This is all on the up and up. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It, it almost feels like, He's, he's done because once again I don't want to get ahead of myself but like in the later movies Clouseau has a an Asian man servant who he pays to attack him periodically <laughs> sure. with martial arts weapons uh-huh. uh, when he's least expecting it so he's always at the ready and it leads to a lot of hijinks but there was a part of that that feels like this is the kind of genesis of the idea that this guy who's helping so Charles 
He's like, obviously said to him, he's like, you know, this stealing this jewel is going to be really easy. At some point, just throw me a curveball. And this guy's taking it literal, like, well, I will burn the rope while you're on it then. Yeah, I just <laughs> wish someone had <laughs> explained why this guy is doing this. It doesn't explain it. And yeah. I would love to say that like, future films will go back. No, they don't. Yeah, it's fine. But I, I started this movie with a Confused. question mark over my head. <laughs> Like, I, I'm a Metal Gear Solid guard, you know, blink. Blink? Yeah. Blink! I'm looking <laughs> around, there's just a nondescript box that nobody could possibly be in. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, all right, so we cut from that over to the handsomest man on earth, Robert Wagoner, who is yes. graduating from college. He's, like, doing, he's at, like, a photographer's place. This guy's literally the talented Mr. Ripley. Yeah. Like he's like, he's, he's like <laughs> everything he's doing is a grift. Like, everything he's doing is a grift. Right. And, and as he's getting this, one presumes, fake picture of his graduation put together, mm-hmm. some guys show up looking for him, some thugs. And it's a real, like, hey, where, where's Robert Wagner? We're here to, <laughs> we're here to t- break his kneecaps. And... His his photographer pal that he is apparently paying to take this, um, you know, fraudulent fra- photograph because yeah. he clearly did not study for four years at university. No. He's just in at the end. So yeah, he, ex- he explains what he was up to, and it's a pretty good explanation. But, um, but yeah, so he's just like, hey, uh, you know, photographer guy, get tell these guys to beat it, will you? And. <laughs> Um, so he ends up kind of escaping from these thugs. So we, we have introduced our two m- main, uh, you know, protagonists. For the most part. Yeah, 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 yeah. For the most part. And so we also get an introduction to the wife of, uh, we will learn, the wife of Inspector Clouseau, Simone. Yeah. Who Simone. is also dodging some, some people after her, only in this case it's the cops. Because she is having having this clandestine meeting in Paris. Mm-hmm. So we know as the audience that she is up to no good. Right from the off. Yeah. And and so we, after introducing all those characters, we finally come to who will be the, the most interesting character in the movie, which is <laughs> Inspector Clouseau, who is... Uh, One of my favorite introductions to <laughs> it spins the globe. And then puts his English yeah. right in his face. So yeah, so you know he's kind of bumbling from jump, and he's like, "We have to find the Phantom." Yeah. And Once again, like focus on the accent because the accent in this movie is okay. And yeah. In subsequent it's not movies, crazy. the the mispronunciation of things is deliberate and meant for like for for jokes. But in this one, he's still played. He's clumsy, but the character still played relatively straight. Yeah. And then and the, his wife comes in at this point. We're like, well, wait, I just saw you being yeah. followed by the police. You're up to no good. And we, as the audience, realize, like, oh, he is hunting her. Yeah. But we don't know. Or like, he doesn't know that, but we know that. So he is, you know, not only is he a bit bumbling, he's also a little dumb. He's not a great cop. Right. So then we catch up to Princess Dalla, who we last saw as a child. Uh, mm-hmm. getting the this diamond and she is now played by claudia cardinal yeah uh um, who is absolutely stunning just gorgeous yeah um and she is now in exile because her father has died there's been the, this military takeover of the country that she was in charge of whatever it was yeah. like <laughs> the moon of pandora or whatever <laughs> yeah it's it doesn't matter and so she's skiing around, and then David Niven spots her because he is also at this resort, and he's like, "Well, hello, Ness." And yeah. so he skis after her, and uh, there, there's um, uh, who else is there? There's um, Sir Charles is, is there. There's yeah. Dalla. There is, and we'll get to the everyone else who shows up. Yeah, but she's got she's got like a man servant, a guy called Salud, who's there as well, who basically is looking after her, um, and, and making sure she's okay. Um, 
And at this point, I think that's everyone's essentially all the characters you've been introduced to are all going to converge on this ski resort, yeah. which is basically where the movie takes place. Yeah, in Cortina d'Ampezzo is the name of the place. Yeah. And anyway, so once after kind of, you know, following Dalla around, when uh, Sir Charles goes back to his hotel room, we he opens up a medicine cabinet and there's a note inside mm-hmm. that says, kidnap tomorrow with an exclamation point. So you're like, aha. So some evil, evil shit is about to be afoot. And David David is like, yes, kidnapping. (laughs) (laughs) And. (laughs) So the the kidnapping in question is that Dalla's manservant has her uh, little dog. Yes. And somebody comes along and just swipes this dog. Just yep. like, yoink! <laughs> and David Niven is there to be like, why, Princess Dalla, someone has stolen your dog. Yeah. And... I will chase him down on skis. Right. Allow me to help you, princess. <laughs> and so he chases after the dog, but he ends up crashing into the sleigh. Yes. And 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 takes a, a bad spill. Mm-hmm. And so not only is the dog not rescued, but he has uh in theory injured himself. We'll find out that's Yeah, yeah, he has he's now got an injury he has to big up um here. But this is all part like the, the, the all part of his now master plan to ingratiate yeah. himself into her good graces. Uh, but what what it's probably worth saying, Sir Charles has the international reputation as what we would call it in Scotland, bit of a shagger. Um, <laughs> yeah. So like, um, which apparently everyone in this movie is totally fine with. Like every story yeah. is about how much pussy Sir Charles is getting. Like every single st- from everyone. What? Well, yeah. One of my favorite bits in the movie is where. You know, basically, he should. The, he has a conversation about like, "Hey, you're in your forties and you're doing nothing but laying pipe and yeah. instead of like settling down and having, you know, a wife and kids and all the stuff that a respectable person would do." And he's just like, "I have no problem with any of this. Like, this, <laughs> this all sounds great." <laughs> I'm gonna go back to my room with the giant cabinet that I open, just full of booze. Right, and Holy one of, shit, that's a mini bar I want, though. Let's see which woman shows up in my my room tonight for me to shag. <laughs> um, but oh, oh, and then uh, so Cluzo and and his wife Simone show up, and he yes. literally runs into the litter, the uh, uh, you know, yeah, uh, that Sir Charles is being carried on after his accident, yeah. <laughs> And in pretty short order, we realize, like, oh, Simone and Sir Charles are hooking up. They're in cahoots. They, not only are they in cahoots, they're in cabed. Yes, yeah. But and they did, like, she's she's booked the room right next yeah. door to his with an adjoining door, which I've never understood that. I've, ne- I've never understood that thing. I t- I'm assuming it's for families when families stay abroad. But I, yeah. the, idea of, uh, the idea of an internal door, which allows me to go to someone else's room, I think it's creepy, but I, yeah, I, I understand say. like, okay. So like on those cruise cabins, yes, it makes sense because you are going to have like, you know, here's a room for the adults. Here's a room for the kids. A hundred percent. You can kind of move back and forth freely, but uh, a hotel, different animal. I think you just don't want yeah. that. I don't want I don't want somebody accidentally walking into, I mean, you keep it locked and everything, but yeah you know some a good hard kick yeah <laughs> <clears throat> you know it's like the movie sneakers where <laughs> there's the the uh new electronic lock that's unbeatable mm-hmm. and there's yeah. that great gag where he's like all right well how do i get past it and you just see robert uh yeah. redford going uh-huh yeah. okay yeah uh and then yeah <laughs> okay all right and then yeah Okay. Okay. Got it. And then he just kicks the door open. It's such a great gag, but it's like that happened. That's a hotel room door waiting to happen. 
I don't want any part of this. But yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, Sir Charles gets an invitation from Princess Della to go to dinner. Um, Which he thinks is one-on-one bowl. Right. And it, he also, as he's getting this invitation, like he gets up out of bed and we realize like, oh, you big faker, your leg is totally yeah. fine. This is just part of your insidious plot to be like, well, if she thinks that my leg is broken, perhaps she will think that other parts of me are in need of service. <laughs> yeah, it's like being right. blind. If one leg is broken, the penis is twice as good. That's why, why Mozart was so good at composing. I don't know. That's probably not true. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> did I tell you I was taking a history class, Doug? I'm pretty, you did, I'm and it's all, it's all coming up. So, <laughs> anyway, he goes to dinner, but like you said, as soon as he gets there, Princess Della is like, well, you didn't think that I was going to let you be in my presence without at least 30 other chaperones, did you? Because yeah, I like, know what a shagger you are. <laughs> yeah, I, I call this I call this dinner Operation Human Shield. Um, like, <laughs> it's like, yeah, and so while this party is happening, Robert Wagner shows up at this resort as well. Yeah, Look- we find out that he, yeah, we find out at this point because Cluso is with his wife having drinks at the bar. We find out when he shows up that he is actually the nephew mm-hmm. of Sir Charles, which makes Simone choke in her drink, uh, and they go gotta poop, and then she runs off. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, because Robert Wagner is like, say, you're a pretty yeah. good looking woman. Have you considered getting naked with a young Robert Wagner before? Yeah. Yeah. And Peter Sellers is like, hello. <laughs> it's like, you right hello. This is my wife. Um, <laughs> yeah. He doesn't have a lot to do at the front end of this movie. No, no, no. Um, but, and, and, and Sir Charles ends up seeing Simone. In, like out the window like frantically waving at him and he's like hmm excuse me everyone i have to go potentially have sex with someone well I, this comes at a, a very poignant moment because um there's all these stories being regaled about how much of a top shagger sir charles is yeah. uh and then the princess like he's, he's being very suave and she just she makes those comments specifically um to him which when he then has to make an excuse to leave, she thinks that she's upset his feelings. Yeah, yeah. She's not aware that he, no, he's actually going outside to try and find Simone, who apparently ran to the window, waved a couple of times, and then just went away. It just took off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because immediately we cut to, from him leaving yeah. to the Clouseau hotel room. Yeah, where Clouseau is constantly trying to get laid, but he is never, ha- he's fucking amazing. <laughs> he's DTF the entire movie. And and she is like, um, oh, before we do that, I need you to get some blankets. Oh, and yeah. also, can you turn out the lights? Also, I'm probably going to need a glass of milk. Yes. And so af- af- after his repeated attempts to climb into bed with her are rebuffed, for her laundry list of like you know yeah it goes it goes to get it goes to get milk which is the excuse that she has then to chap on sir charles's door but it goes downstairs to get milk fucking amazing it's the small things i love really really silly slapstick humor it goes downstairs to the kitchen to steal milk and he comes out and he's trying to make his way back up the stairs and he thinks he hears a noise so he leans forward with the glass which just pours out half the milk yeah, yeah. Uh, and then he's like he looks at it and he's like oh, well maybe i can clean it with my foot which just makes it worse and then he's like yeah right and he goes upstairs by the time he gets back into the room though it's a half full glass of milk and he's like yeah they don't really have much milk in this yeah, hotel it, it's, it's like, one, one of the better moments in this movie is is her saying that's all that's all the milk and he, and he yeah. goes it's all that they had yeah um, <laughs> which is pretty good and but, but in she the chaps meantime, on the door. Yeah, yeah, she yeah she chaps on the door and like makes her way in, and uh, starts being a little bit like in the bed, all kind of cuddling up to uh, Robert Wagner. Mm-hmm. Climbs into bed, thinking that it's Sir Charles, and Robert Wagner yeah. is like, "Say, I didn't realize <laughs> I ordered a a Simone Clouseau," and she's like, "I," and, she, and it takes off. 
<laughs> I got a poop. <laughs> right. And then she's away. <laughs> and and so Dala also heads up to the room. Yeah. To basically apologize for, you know, hey, I'm sorry if I was kind of terrible to you. Yeah. Um and b- there's a whole scene with them where she ends up getting drunk. Yeah, she doesn't drink. This yeah. is the thing. She's she doesn't drink, and Sir Charles very, very quickly manages to persuade her to drink champagne, which goes to her head really, really quick. And I, I, I to be honest, I really love this scene because uh, uh Claudia Card Cardani um as a drunk in this is very very funny like when she's lying on top of the tiger skin mm-hmm. and she's like I've got, yeah, I've got friends you know and she's looking at the tiger and like, they, they, like all this stuff is really charming but then at the same time this is 1963 so the insinuation here is this old man is just plying her a drink and then probably going to take advantage of her absolutely yeah and she ends up passing out and I and I agree like I, I think this scene is very charming yeah. between her and, and Niven and uh, but it also points out like she's what twenty two or something. If and, not, and, yeah, and he is <laughs> mid forties easily. Yes, and uh, but like like the, he doesn't take advantage of her when no, she no. passes out. He he does the gentlemanly thing to do because once again we get this idea that maybe he does care for her a little bit. Yes. Um, uh, but he, he tries to bring her through at the bed, but as in bring her through at the bed, I love it. It's kind of classic comedy thing. He's trying to pull her through, but he can't get around. So Robert Wagner comes in to help and he doesn't clock that it's him. He's like, oh, thanks very much. Like this. And yeah. he's like, oh, like, what? Yeah. Um, yeah. And the, yeah. And and so Wagner ends up hel- helping Dala into the bed. Yeah. While this is going on in the Clouseau bedroom, there is a, uh, a comedy bit, Duncan. Yes. Where after he returns with the milk and, and does the, you know, it's all that they hit. Um. Yeah. Uh, she's like, "Oh my, you know, my head's still hurting," and he's like, "I know what will make you better here," and, <laughs> yeah. and pulls out a violin and plays he's it. Tr- he's trusty, <laughs> and he plays it in the same manner that like your third week violin student might i mean it's just <laughs> it's, it's clear it's clearly a nod because so is him a mulgram in lots of he's like a, a bit of poirot he's clearly a bit of sherlock holmes yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it, it sounds like a like a cat whose tail has been jammed in a tree um the, the, it's just horrible <laughs> the best part is when she's like no stop and he's like what it is not to doing the trick <laughs> As if it has worked in the past. In the past. Yeah, gotten her in the mood. I did like, I like, yeah, it's like, it's like anything to stop him playing the violin. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Of course I'll have sex for you. Like, let's do it now. I'll put the violin down. Um, oh, man. And and uh, eventually she just proposes that she's got to take some sleeping pills, and he probably should too. Yeah. And they're just going to pass out. So, um. Then so that's how all everybody ends up that night. The next day, Simone is like finally gets Niven alone. And yeah. It's like, hey, I was climbing into bed with you last night, and there was a stranger there. And he's like, yes, that was my nephew. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Princess Dalla uh, has run into Robert Wagner. Yeah, and he's giving her a bit about like. You know, I was thinking of going to college or maybe into the Peace Corps. <laughs> I don't know wherever I can do the most good. And <sighs> uh, David Niven and Simone show up and they're all kind of, you know, in the downstairs sort of lounge area. And um, Dalla says, oh, I'm leaving that afternoon. And, uh, but first I'm going to go take some skiing lessons. And Robert Wagner is like, skiing lessons, you say? I've always meant to try those. And so he's going to go on skiing lessons uh, yeah. with Simone. Well, yeah, yeah. He, he, he very quickly, Sir Charles manages to circumnavigate this by getting Simone to offer to take him yeah. skiing, to get him out of the way so Sir Charles can once again do Operation seduction of princess to get 
valuable jewels. Um, and he also has to he also has to formulate a plan now to get the princess to stay at the resort. Yeah. So because she's going to go, she can't go yet. <laughs> which then, like, we don't see it, but he obviously gets in touch with the the pup napper um, mm-hmm. and basically says, you know, we have to stage it in such a way where you know we can keep you here. Um, thus finishing the I rescued your dog bit, um, which yeah. is what this whole hijinks bit sets out to. We have um, Robert Wagner kind of floundering about the place, not knowing what he's doing, but ultimately accidentally getting set off. Turns out he's a really good skier, um, or accidentally a really good skier because he goes away down the hill, some own face plants. Um, as uh, Sir Charles is saying goodbye to um, the princess as she's getting ready to go. He sees well, the vehicle mm-hmm. uh, that, you know, of, with the guy who stole it. He's like, by Jove, there's the, the, the pup napper. I will get him by using this. Once again, he's got a car. I'm going to steal this horse sleigh thing. Yeah, I, I absolutely. I, like Santa and his sleigh sleigh. Yeah. Yeah, I, I pursues him there, and he's almost, he's almost got the pup, but Robert Wagner, like, so, ah, comes down, floors him, flattens him into the snow, goes across, scares off the pup napper, gets the dog, thus making him the quasi-hero of this scenario, but also keeping the princess at the resort. Mm-hmm. So, failed, didn't work, but the ultimate goal succeeded. It's really cartoony. This whole yeah. this whole sequence yeah. is super cartoonish, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, then we get the swinging sixties party happening at the lodge, where like j- like we just have a woman here who is singing, and we all know the dance, and we're all going to get involved with yeah. the dance. We all know the words. It, it, I mean, it's one of the most like sixties moments of the movie. Oh, everyone's like, eating fondue. Like yeah. everyone has a cheese fondue. Um, <laughs> everyone's eating fondue. <laughs> I mean, there's totally macrame is. owls on the wall, <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, it's like a sea like, of lava lamps as far as the eye can. <laughs> yeah, but like you said, like everybody starts dancing uh, yeah. along with them, and then with after everybody's done dancing, including Clouseau, by the way, who is yeah, gets he gets in involved. Yeah, uh, but there, there's a conversation. Uh, that Clouseau has with like his his police counterparts later, where he's, he's convinced the Phantom's going to show up. Right, that's because... why he's here. He lets like which explains why he is convinced from evidence he's found somewhere else that the Phantom is there already and is going to do something. Right, and not only is, is he convinced, you know, he, the Phantom is not only <laughs> at this lodge. But maybe in this room, yes, and uh, and this is also where Dallas says, "Well, the the current government that runs the country that I fled from do- has demanded this diamond back." Yeah, but I refuse to give it up because this was a gift from my father. This has nothing to do with the country. This was, you know, yeah, a, a gift from one wealthy person to another wealthy person, mm-hmm. and and screw the country, <laughs> and so. Simone and David Niven go dance while Princess Dalla and Robert Wagner also kind of dance together. And um, that just culminates in Dalla taking off. Yeah. And so uh, David Niven is like, hello, nephew. How about you dance (laughs) with the inspector's wife? I have a princess to shag. (laughs) And so he goes off to chase her. And uh, after that, apparently that uh, just leads him further down the road of being into Simone because later he ends up placing a crank call to Clouseau's room. Yeah. Pretending to be this other cop to say like, hey, I, you know, I, I need you to come here for some handsome police business. Yeah. (laughs) But it's, it's notably in the, the adjacent town. Yes. So he's going to have to leave the hotel and go and be gone for a while. Yeah. And that's, you know, this is his play. He thinks, if I can get the hubby out the, of the room here, I can make my moves with Simone. Um, 
and she'll fall in love with me because look at me, young Ro- mm-hmm. Robert Wagner. Um, and of course, as soon as she comes in, Simone's like, listen, we can't do this, mostly because Simone is sleeping with Sir Charles uh, yeah. and she doesn't want to sleep with his nephew. So, And she goes to Ch- Sir Charles to get a little yeah. action and he's he kind of puts her off and, and this is where she's like, oh, you're into princess Dala. You're, yeah you're, you're falling now falling for her. the yeah you're falling in love with the princess so everything's all over the place but ultimately uh so charles can't get back in his room when robert wagner shows up so he decides to hide under the bed right. i think yeah it is he at first. goes under the bed then clouseau shows back up this is the big set piece of this movie in right. terms of like all the parts coming together because this feels very much like uh and it's not but it feels very much like a one big shot one big continuous yeah. kind of set it's, piece thing. it's very bedroom farce kind of stuff yes 100 percent. which is he shows back up and he's like the call was a fic and yeah. so simone goes to the bathroom where she finds that Robert Wagner is hidden in the shower. Niven yeah. is under the bed. Yeah. Um, the the flowers that Robert Wagner shows up uh, with have Which been. is just a vase he's picked right. from outside that he just leaves on the floor. Yeah. And so that ends up falling and shattering. So a maid yeah. shows up to clean that while Niv- David Niven goes from the bed to hide behind the curtains yeah robert wagner makes his way out but can't get out in time so he goes under the bed yeah so clouseau then is like you know how about the little music and so like his wife is gonna take a bath he's Mm -hmm. gonna play some music to get her in the mood and while all this is going down he kind of spots these wet footprints that go from the bathroom yeah. to the bed <laughs> while he's checking that out niven slips out onto the balcony um simone calls clouseau back into the bathroom mm-hmm. finally like robert wagner gets out the front door niven goes out the window and uh finally like simone has taken her bath Clouseau is now ready for some action. They jump into bed together, even though he has seen plenty of suspicious stuff. He's ignoring all of it and they're about to get down. And then right before they can, a a champagne bottle pops between them. Which was hidden in the bed. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Meanwhile, though, in the other room, though, uh, Robert Wagner's went back in there and he has found his uncle's suitcase, which we can see David Niven seen through the the window of his nephew opening yeah. the suitcase and he finds all this gear and paraphernalia which prove that Sir Charles is none other than the Phantom, which causes him to fall off into a huge like snow mound and walk out in his pajamas, still looking suave and shaggable, uh doing a bit of this. Yeah. And then back into the hotel. Oh. An end scene. Also, Wagoner in in before he finds the Phantom stuff gets a call from yeah. Niven's partner. Who's, yeah, he's like that. <laughs> he tells him that Princess Dalla has checked out. Yes. So um, then, all right. So Inspector Clouseau then gets a call that the dude who stole the dog is actually employed by Sir Charles, and he's like, "Aha!" Uh-huh. And he, <laughs> Sir Charles is the Phantom, no? So Clouseau goes to his door, Sir Charles's door, and David Niven is coming around the corner, spots him yeah. at the door, and is like, "Oh no, I've been, I've been found out." And so when he goes back to his room, he realizes that his coat is gone. Yeah, and it and this was stolen by Simone. Yeah, Simone to give to <laughs> Sir Charles. Yeah. who now escapes from the hotel disguised as Inspector Clouseau. Clouseau. Yeah. <clears throat> so then we shift the action to Rome, which is kind of the end of our movie. Yeah, yeah. And so Clouseau uh, ends up catching up with Princess Dalla in Rome, where he tells her, like, oh, the Phantom is Sir Charles. 
and mm-hmm. uh, that they're having a big party that night. Clouseau is going to stake out the party with his men because it is too big a target for the Phantom to pass up. So he is certainly yeah. going to to show up. Um, and then at the party that night, Clouseau dresses up as a knight, <laughs> and in in one of like one of a handful of, of jokes in this movie that really made me laugh. There's a great moment where he's talking to kind of his second in command mm-hmm. and a zebra strolls up to the table behind them and starts <laughs> drinking from this punch bowl. And he's like, well, wait a second, who are you? And it turns out that they're, you know, uh, police that are, yep. have combined to make a zebra and it's a dumb joke, but it really works for me. Is like, yeah, yeah. It's like, all right, no more drinking for you. You're on duty. Any more of this fooling around, and I'll have your stripes. Yeah, <laughs> it's a it's a real <laughs> dumb zebra joke, but I don't care. <laughs> point, and there's another joke earlier I didn't point out, but it's when he realizes who Sir Charles is, and he calls like the inspector into the room. And he's got yeah. his gun pulled. Yes. <laughs> and he's waving it around as as he's talking to the this other inspector who is, keeps grabbing Clouseau's hand to move the gun away from yeah. his midsection. <laughs> and one, at one point when he's pushing the gun away, Clouseau goes, what are you doing? This thing is loaded. Are you trying to get shot? <laughs> and it's, it's a good Clouseau joke. Um, so both of the, those are two solid jokes that made me laugh in this movie. Yeah. The I'll have your straps. And the thing that re- I really like about it is that Clouseau is kind of proud of that joke. Yeah. Because he mentions yeah. it to the other guy. Like I told him I'd take his straps. Um, yeah. Anyway, it's very funny. <laughs> so then uh, it David Niven and Robert Wagner both show up. At this uh, this party, both dressed as gorillas, by the way. Yeah. Identical gorilla outfits. And um, so they get inside, uh, despite the fact that it's guarded, but, you know, like David Niven's flunky distracts him long enough to sneak past and that kind of thing. And so at this party with our gorillas now there, the mm-hmm. lights go out. And... Um, they go for the safe and while uh, people are trying to find lights and so forth, Clouseau gets what he thinks is a candle, but is in fact a Roman candle. Yeah. <laughs> Which is the point where you're like, is Clouseau just stupid? Yeah. And because he like, it's one, well, it, it's such a, <laughs> a, a, a discrepancy, I think in the character, because on the one hand, you've got him making this stripes joke, which is, yeah, a really dumb joke, but it's also kind of clever. It's wordplay. Yes. And yeah, the yeah. next minute, he doesn't know that this Roman candle spewing gunpowder flame out is not a candle. Yes. And you're like, Ugh, all right, I guess. <laughs> but sure enough, this the Roman candle fires off and goes to the it hits the box with the rest of the fireworks, and then all of a sudden, fireworks are going off everywhere. Yeah. Uh, which creates a distraction long enough for Robert Wagner and David Niven to get to Princess Dalla's room where there is a safe Mm -hmm. that has an opening on both sides. And there's this whole mirror bit yeah, where the two of them are opening the safe at the same time and then see each other, but think it's themselves Yeah, kind of creeping around the safe and stuff. It's, Again, a very 1960s kind of gag that I yeah. don't think totally works. Um, but, and then there's another thing that I don't like in movies, which is a great big car chase scene. Yeah. <laughs> it's the 60s. Yeah. And so in a very like mad, 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 mad world kind of thing, um, everybody's got a car. They're, yep. they're doing a roundabout. The one gag that I like about this is they keep passing this one Italian dude as like yep. cars are going by with gorillas driving them and Inspector Clouseau. A lot, of the, a lot of what you're seeing in this, these will be refined in later. 
and Clueso movies. So like, is this is weirdly like the first? Is almost as if they're trying a lot of things at the first run, and the later iterations of the same jokes are much better. And but the gag I like, or the part of this gag I like, is that the Italian guy just goes and gets a chair and sits yeah. down to watch all of this chaos happen. At which point you hear this screech of metal, everybody crashes, and then you know the camera pans over as you see all these cars smooshed together and people mm -hmm. hanging out of the windows and all kinds of stuff. And so uh, Sir Charles and Robert Wagner end up being taken to jail. And that's the point where Robert Wagner tells him like, oh yeah, I've been running a scam the entire time, Uncle <laughs> Charles. Um, you know, like he, he basically says he got an apartment in Hollywood and pretended to be a producer or whatever just to get laid a bunch. And it's like, ah, all right, I guess that works. Um, <laughs> it's easy as that. Yeah. And so also, um, and, and nobody knows who actually took the diamond because Sir Charles, mm -hmm. by the time Sir Charles and Robert Wagner show up, the diamond's gone. They haven't actually stolen anything. <clears throat> so Simone then goes to Princess Dalla um to tell her like hey if you don't press charges like he can get off because he didn't actually steal anything mm -hmm. and you need to help defend him and that's where dala basically says no 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 i'm the one who stole the diamond so i didn't have to turn this over to yep. this government that's been after it and also uh she's kind of into sir charles and has a plan to save him from prison and she says, we just have to convince them that somebody else stole this diamond. <laughs> and so we go to the trial. Mm -hmm. Like the, It's weird because the middle of this movie, the whole second act takes place at this one resort. And it's basically yep. like two days yep. at this resort. And then we, the back end of this... We go to Rome, and then there's a trial and all this stuff. We like, need to. We, got, we, <laughs> we need to get this out of here, bro. We yeah. need to get them out. <laughs> it happens so fast. Like, weeks are going by in the space of seconds in this movie. And Yeah, uh, and it's not a short movie. Well, this no, is just, a a, like, just, just under two hours. And so at the trial, the defense um, calls their, their only witness, who is uh, a very surprised Inspector Clouseau, who asks him a lot of questions about like, you know, so you were always at the place where the phantom stole stuff. And he's mm -hmm. like, well, yes, I was hot on his trail. <laughs> and uh, he's like, were you, or could it be that you yourself are the phantom? He's like, what? That's ridiculous. And so he, Clouseau pulls out a handkerchief to like wipe his brow or whatever. But he's never put his hands in his pockets since Sir Charles had this jacket. Right and which was like several countries ago and apparently the passage of time <laughs> so, right and this heavy ass diamond that's been in his coat for months yeah uh just falls out and everybody's like oh my god you're the phantom and so um and so like there's a big riot Clouseau is 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 taken to prison um where uh, along the way a bunch of women are like you know, banging on the car and uh, throwing kisses at him and screaming and yeah. stuff. And we see that Simone, Sir Charles, and Robert Wagner are all hanging out, like, in a car somewhere watching all this go down. Mm -hmm. And Simone's like, oh, I feel bad that my husband is going to prison. <laughs> and and Sir Charles is like, nah, it's going to be fun. Listen, darling, as soon as I steal some more shit they'll realize they don't have the real phantom. Yeah. And uh, so, and he basically invites Robert Wagner, like, you know, the next big score is going to be in South America. Would you like to come along, handsome Robert Wagner? <laughs> sure, Uncle Charles. <laughs> don't know why he said handsome in there, but I am handsome, so yeah, it's accurate. It's, it's hard to argue. Um, <laughs> so, on the, they're taking Clouseau to prison. And a couple of cops are in the back seat, and they're like, you know, these women are just crazy about you. But as we're on our way, 
Uh, I just have to ask you, how did you actually commit all of those crimes? Mm -hmm. And Clouseau, because he is now suddenly the object of lust. (laughs) He's not been able to get any in the entire movie. Right. (laughs) And still is not going to be able to, unless there's conjugal visits in his future. Yeah, I don't like it. There's flawed logic here. Yeah. Uh, When they ask him how he got away with it, he kind of considers it and goes, well, you know, it wasn't easy. Yeah. And and so the movie ends. Uh boom, boom, boom. Yeah, like the Pink Panther the animated boom, Pink boom. Panther pops up and is like the end of the movie, everybody. And <laughs> and that's it. That's the original sixty three Pink the, Panther. Yeah, that's that is it. That is that is as that is as done. Um I mean the the pro the, the problem with it is uh-huh. it's not a very focused movie. It has and <laughs> It it also has is very lopsided in its humor. Like Cluso is the entire humor of this movie. It's, it's yeah. his his slapstick, his you know his shenanigans, and ultimately like his buffoonery that are all the humor or the farcical aspect of the movie. The rest is played surprisingly straight. Yeah, I mean, it's got kind of this romance element between Sir Charles and Princess Dalla. Yeah. Um, There's all this stuff that uh, with Robert Wagner that totally doesn't matter. It doesn't go anywhere. In the grand scheme of this movie. Yeah, Um, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, It's interesting because it, like, when Clouseau and Peter Sellers are on screen, it does feel like a totally different movie. Yeah. And obviously that is what Blake Edwards realized. And, and there's a rumor like later David Niven was, was asked about this movie and, you know, was pretty quick to say like, Oh, that was not my movie. That was, I was not the star of the pink Panther. That he, he was, was like, supposed you know. to be, he yeah. was supposed to be, but I think they realized very quickly. Now he'll return. Uh, David Niven returns later on in the series, but, Ultimately, what you get very, very, very quickly is Blake Edwards. Apparently, once again, as the rumor goes, as the rumor machine goes, um, had set up like he did multiple, multiple takes and cameras in various different positions, and he basically told sellers to ad lib. Yeah, just like like very much like how Jim Carrey does his stuff. Just go like do, like just keep riffing on things, and and he found that like sellers like had an like an unending supply of funny quirks, things he did, added bits. Um, so they knew they had something there. What is surprising to me is how very, very, very quickly the next movie just grims itself completely in comedy. It's like all the, uh, everything is like everything away. It is a slapstick comedy movie from now on. That's yeah. the series moving forward. And that the, is a joy to behold because it's it knows what it is. This movie struggles because one, it's too long. Mm-hmm. Two, like you mentioned, that the back third of this movie is essentially jet setting and condensed into like a very short window. Like the, the, it's like twenty minutes. We have Rome, the trial, and the end, and a huge bit in the middle, which is well, so is Sir Charles falling in love with the princess? What, who's Simone? And it's a lot of that stuff sets up some gags, but not nearly enough. Um, and yeah, it's, it's like it's one of those movies which weirdly, like had there been no other movies after this, that would make sense to me. But right. the fact that they did make mo- more movies after this, but focus specifically in on the Clouseau character that makes sense to me because that's the entertaining part of the movie. Um, that's the bit that you like, you find it's kinetic, it's fun, it's fast paced, and it's all close to doing dumb shit. The transformation of the character into the next movie is just mind blowing, though, because it's like he, his pronunciation of English words like gets incredibly ropey, so he mispronounces words. Um, uh, you know, I'm an officer of the Lou, mm-hmm. like the the, the Lou. The loo, which in the UK is the toilet. Sure. So it's all that play upon things where, like, you you have a minky on your shoulder. It's like, yeah. uh, what? Yeah, like, what? A minky? <laughs> all this stuff, which is not in this movie. 
like at all the character completely transforms into the next movie and that's the stuff that i know for a fact we're gonna have a ball talking about because that's not laughs and that's not laughs an hour it's laughs a minute bob we we shall so. see it is yeah a shot in the dark is is the next thing on our plate yeah uh, so funny which man, I'm, honestly. I'm looking forward to to seeing so all right let's let's evaluate our laughs per hour yeah. um this I did not find terribly funny. It's uh, not a particularly funny movie. No. There, there were there were probably four total times that I laughed out loud, and it's the stuff that I mentioned, like the milk thing is really funny. The him waving the gun around is funny. The zebra thing is funny, and then <laughs> something else I'm sure made me laugh. Um, but you know, basically two laughs an hour, which is not a great. <laughs> Uh, well, no, no, yeah. no, no, not overall, not overall. Um, and yeah. I will give you a little bit of trivia if you want, Please. which yeah, will yeah. give you something to make you you smile. Um, Shot in the Dark, next movie we're going to discuss, screenplay co-written by one William Peter Blatty. No kidding. Yeah, of Exorcist fame and Exorcist Three: The Heretic. Huh. Well, that uh... co-wrote it. Uh, Ain't no exorcism in it. There was no mother sucking cocks in hell or anything. Um, is 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 played right down the middle. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, so. uh, the the uh, as uh, Beetlejuice himself once said, "The Exorcist keeps getting funnier every single time I watch it." <laughs> um, I'm looking forward to that. That uh, that yeah. like I said, uh, I I can recognize in Sellers' performance. Yeah. Like there are moments where I'm like, man, if you just let him go, this could be very funny, but it's it, this this just isn't that movie. But it's interesting to see where this starts. And yeah. 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 So Yeah, you get you get all the all the characters that will be synonymous with the the CDs moving forward during the next one. I just checked. Um so Herbert Lom is a uh, um Charles Dreyfus, who is basically Clouseau's boss, mm-hmm. who totally realizes he's the worst he's the worst cop in the world, but no one else in the world, no one else can see how bad he is at his job. Um and so he's gonna be in it, and his manservant Cato, mm-hmm. who's played by uh, played by Bert uh Bert, I can never pronounce his surname, Quok, maybe so that, who is absolutely fucking amazing. So those characters are in it as of the next movie. So we are in Bo. We are fucking in. You're gonna love it. You're gonna laugh lots. All right. Um, there's some questionable, slightly questionable humor in there as pertains to how certain characters speak about certain races, which hasn't aged very well. Uh, sure. You know, but again, this is 1964, and we talked about yeah. Birth of a Nation earlier. So, oh yeah, yeah. it's as nowhere near as bad as that. It's not. It's not. It's still way near as bad. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm very much looking forward to it. Uh, I, I would probably, if we're doing last per hour, I'd probably agree with you. I think there's maybe about two at the most three. Um, I do laugh hard at the really silly slapstick stuff. I think it's, but there's not enough of it in the movie overall. Like the, the globe gag to me is just, it gets me every time because everyone spins a globe, but like how many people would they lean on it? She's from... <laughs> just it, his recovery is the thing that's funny about yeah. that. It's yes, the, the quick yes. pop up, straight um, up. Yeah, nothing happened. Yeah, so uh, yeah, uh, you know, again, I'm I'm excited to to get deeper into this. But uh, between now and then, Duncan, when we come yes. back in two weeks to talk about a shot in the dark, uh, yes, a movie that Ooh, I have a hundred percent never seen. Oh, I can't wait, man. Um, <laughs> so, uh, where can people find more out of you? And let me just say, Kreskin like, I mm-hmm. bet it's at tputscast.com. It is. It is. That's where links to everything I do is podcast under stairs about to, by the time this episode drops formally for the people out there, will have completed its first full week of summer series. Um, so you're getting four episodes a week for 10 weeks um, for summer series. It's going to be an insane amount of content, but it's all great. Bo is on that. Mm-hmm. So if you like it when Bo talks about stuff with me, uh, you'll be there. He's doing stuff. Um, so yeah, and then the Teapots Collective is the second feed, which is also available through teapotscast.com. Um, over there, you can get things up here to begin with, which is currently looking at neo-noir and film noir um, through my suggestions. The movie we're doing on the next episode is Memento. 
uh, the film debut by one Christopher Nolan. Yeah, terrific. Uh, great yeah. example of neo noir. Um, we're also doing uh, a little bit of Chronicle over there, which will be coming back real soon with another guest to talk about a European horror movie. Um, Opera Omnia, I've put a pin on purely because summer series is kicking my ass for scheduling, and and we're in between seasons, so that's fine. And doing the nasty, where me and Mark are continuing our look at the tier three video nasties list which is just a kick in the balls every time we record so there we are. <laughs> uh, all right excellent uh and obviously um uh, if you want more out of me then uh, you can go over to legionpodcasts.com where you can catch up on uh pick six movies where chad and i are currently doing a season called Crichton in the middle with you uh which is all about michael Crichton movies oh dear and uh have you done congo yet oh that was episode one was congo oh and mr hamulka stop eating my sesame cake man. all right so here's the thing i did tim curry is amazing in the movie he's so good it, it have you seen the clip from the command and conquer game where oh yeah the i it's time to go to one place capitalism cannot find us space space yeah, yeah. so tim curry yeah i i and everything i drop that that into the show because i was <laughs> i was trying to describe it to chad who had never seen it and i was like his delivery of the one word space is like six syllables there's all oh, kinds of vowels in yeah. it that you would uh not expect to find um but yeah so we're doing that we just dropped the episode on westworld uh ah, nice the, the next one will be timeline which is a I don't know if I've seen that. Oh, don't. That's a, a <laughs> strangely directed by Richard Donner and boring as hell. So really, yeah. yeah. Did you know that Richard the, Donner's a fucking great director he as well? Is, but can you imagine Richard Donner directing a movie with Gerard Butler, Billy Connolly, and Paul Walker? And it is unwatchable. Billy Connolly's in Billy it. Billy Connolly is in it. How have I never heard of this movie? Dude, the only reason I watched it is because Billy Connolly was in it. And that was a mistake. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, Timeline is uh, is coming up uh, on the next episode. And it's, yeah, it's a real stinker. Uh, but Richard Donner is a fascinating dude. And, like, I'm working right now, in fact, on the introductory piece about Richard Donner. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Who's, who's, by all accounts, was a incredibly nice, talented guy. Mm. Um, so that's going on. Heart of Horror, uh, has been tougher to, to kind of get the regular episodes out, um, just because of sickness and school and all that kind of fun stuff. Yep. But there have still been something every week. Uh, most recently I would encourage you to listen to the, the Heart of Horror episode in which, uh, Kate and myself are joined by, uh, one of her friends now, hopefully one of mine, um, uh, a lady named Sabrina, and uh, our discussion of the crow, mm. um, aka uh, our discussion of hot goths, <laughs> and that's all you need to know. It's it's filthy, and um, uh, the, of course this show. I think that's it. Did we just do that succinctly? I think I we, think did, we did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Ooh. we will be back in two weeks to talk about a, a shot in the dark, which is not pornography, as I've recently discovered. <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, and until then, nothing left for me to do but to say to my good pal Duncan, say goodnight, Duncan. My good pal Duncan, say goodnight, Duncan. Oh, that is not right. <laughs> there is a minky on your shoulder now. <laughs> I can't wait, man. I cannot wait. Uh, there's always a minky on my shoulder.